Hello, welcome to New Harvest Christian Fellowship, Manchester, England, and thank you for subscribing to our sermon podcast. The message you're about to hear was recorded live at one of our recent services. We pray it will be a blessing to your life, and if you'd like to get in touch with us, we'll give you our contact information at the end of the recording. Thank you once again. Enjoy the preaching. And before I give you the title of our message, I want to tell you that I wouldn't stay in leadership ministry if I didn't care about the people I serve. I just wouldn't. I would do some other form of ministry. I'm, I'm good in my mind, at least. I keep saying in my mind because that's what I, I feel. Um, in, in many areas. But uh, God's called me to be a leader. And I think that if you're going to be a leader, we're going to have to have a little bit of care about the people we serve. With that being said... Uh, I'm not your chum or your mate. I'm not your father nor your boss. I'm your pastor. There's a difference. Uh, There's a lot of things that may be similar that connect. uh, You know, sometimes I can be a friend to you and I'm a friend. And sometimes I do have to boss people around, you know. Uh, Sometimes I do take on a fatherly tone uh, and all of that. But a pastor is a shepherd. He cares about the people that he serves. He guards them. He protects them. He feeds them. He nurtures them. He makes sure that their spiritual condition uh, is the way that it should be and conducive for growth. And so with that being said, I do care about the people of our church. Sadly, I see them struggle. Too often there are people that are in uh, continual struggle. Some are in perpetual struggle. Every single week, they're just down and discouraged in going through things. Others are not quite that bad, but they are cyclical in their problems. They're good. Praise God. And then the cycle hits, and then they go through a series of days or weeks of ups and downs. And so as your shepherd, I want to give you something that can help you break out of that. I I, I wouldn't say that this is the only thing, but I want to tell you that if you will do what we're going to talk about today, it will significantly, dramatically change your life. Your life will go from being average to being above average. (laughs) It will go from being depressed to being encouraged and being built up. God can do great things if you'll just apply some of these principles that we're going to talk about today. And so we've entitled this message, Me Versus God, How to Win Daily. I was thinking after I put the title down and thinking about it, it might sound like how to win daily, like how to beat God. I don't mean that. What I mean is that sometimes our struggles is that we are in a battle with God. You may not view it like that, but I'm going to lay it out for you. You're going to see how it can be like that. And when I say how to win daily, again, not in your struggle with God, but how to win over yourself daily and become the victorious Christian that this church and your brothers and sisters and your family so desperately needs desperately needs. So understand with me today, and this probably isn't new to you, it's not rocket science, but it's often not applied, is that this, the problem is the battle is in our minds. There is a voice that is in our heads, whether we acknowledge it or not, it is there and it speaks to us. Some of you, it speaks very loudly and you can identify it and you say, man, the voice in my head is constantly saying this or saying that. For others of us, it's a small voice, but it's the voice of who we are and the voice of what we think. And this voice actually wars against God. It's the voice of ourselves, of our fallen nature. And so, how do we win? We're going to help you with that today. We have a slide we're going to move on to and kind of share with you things. There's three 
things I want to lay out for you, and I'm going to do it in four different sections here, and then you can apply this to almost anything else in your life. The thing that I want to identify first is what do I say? What is it that's going through my head? Okay? And then we have to identify what does God say? Okay? What does the voice of my head say? What does God say? And then thirdly, and maybe most importantly, but I think they're all important, is the verse I must claim. How God's word can fit in there. The verse that I need to base my life on. So let's take some examples. I have four of them here for you that will help you to get started. But again, I want you to apply these in every other area that maybe this voice of self is speaking in your head. First of all, we'll have a voice sometimes that says, I feel overwhelmed. Has anybody ever felt that? We felt overwhelmed. That's what happens. You go through a hard day at work, go through some things, you say, and then you come home and, you know, the family or your friends or your car, the bus, just this, and then you come to church and it's not sorted the way you wanted it to be. And before you know it, you're just saying, man, I feel overwhelmed. And maybe for a day, that's okay, right? We all have bad days. But some people are feeling, again, continually, perpetually, or cyclically, overwhelmed. So what does God say? God's response is, let my love and faithfulness guard your heart. He doesn't say, I'll get rid of you this overwhelmed feeling for you. He say, no, allow these things to take place. And the verse that we claim is this, Lamentations 3, 21, 23, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Every morning. Every morning. Tomorrow morning, his compassions will be new and fresh. You can count on that. So if you had a bad day, don't worry. Tomorrow's coming. You with me? It says, great is his faithfulness. So see, here's how you deal with this voice in your head. This will begin to deal with you. You don't ignore that you feel overwhelmed. You don't say it doesn't exist. It's not really there. It is there. But you don't let that be the voice that speaks predominantly in your mind. It doesn't become the the loud clarion trumpet. No. What God says matters more than what I say. Isn't that true? Isn't that true? We know that that's true. What the Prime Minister of Great Britain says is more important to the government than what some guy on the street corner says. What God says to your life is more important than what you say. Now you must take the verse and say, I trust in this. I trust in this verse. This is really Christianity 101, but pastoring a long time, I realize that a lot of people I pastor don't know this, or they don't practice this on a regular basis. Let's move on to keep giving you a feel of this. This is very simple, but important. How about this? I'm nothing special. You start feeling like that. And in one sense, you are nothing special, right? In one sense, you all are just average, just like I'm average. But the truth is, God says you are a masterpiece, So when you begin to say, I'm nothing special, that's really wrong. That's really wrong. You may be just like all the other masterpieces, but you're still a masterpiece because there's a verse that says, for you are God's masterpiece. So so let's just not even read the rest of the verse. When you're reading your Bible, you have to sometimes stop and say, okay, do I believe that? See, see, that's what you got to do. Because sometimes we just feel like, got to read through, I got to get my devotions in, you know. And maybe we ponder a little bit, like, what's the meaning of this verse? But sometimes it's just there. It's simple. You are a masterpiece. So does that mean that you're ever not a masterpiece? Absolutely not. You're always a masterpiece. So even when you're feeling like you're nothing special, you can say, I'm a masterpiece. Even if you're overweight, and some of you might say you're underweight, very few of us like that, but uh, that was a joke. (laughs) 
<laughs> Chihuahua, man. <laughs> We're a masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus. That's just a fact. If you've been born again, even if you got born again when you were four years old, he created a new person in you, different from the person that was born originally. That's what the scripture says. So whenever you're feeling that nothing special or you're just average, you have to begin to say to yourself, no, I'm a masterpiece. I told you at a conference that people should be looking at themselves and saying, I'm great. I can be great. God wants me to do great things. Not in pride, understanding greatness, all those uh, uh, things, but nevertheless, keeping our mind focused on that. So you were created anew in Christ Jesus. And then it says, so, so. Now that's important to the whole process and the whole concept of being a masterpiece, and this is what I want you to do when you read your Bible about the things you're going through. It says, okay, I'm a masterpiece, and I've been created anew in Jesus. So I can do what the rest of the verse says. We can do the things he planned for us long ago. Sometimes you don't feel like a masterpiece. Sometimes you feel like nothing special because you're not doing the things he planned for you a long time ago. You're not fulfilling your call or your role or the things that you're supposed to be doing. And again, I can't get all into this, but sometimes well, our focus is, well, what is my calling and what is this grand thing I'm supposed to be doing? Not, don't do that. What am I supposed to be doing today? What am I supposed to be doing this week? Uh, what is right in front of me? That's what you're supposed to be doing. Your, your calling, your destiny, the things planned in, in the future will come to pass if you take care of business now. So if you're married, you take care of your spouse. If you're not married, you don't just look for a spouse. <laughs> you take care. Yeah, that could get you in trouble, actually. My point being is that here we see this verse. Now, you have to start applying the Bible to your lives in this manner. Here's another one that we often say. I'm not strong enough right? We, we do. You know, we, we get faced with things and we're not strong enough. It was a number of years ago and uh, someone had uh, given me a gym membership for a period of time. So I was going to a gym for a while and uh, working out and, you know, it's exciting. I'm riding my bike and feeling good. It's exciting. You, you're feeling stronger and all of these things. And, you know, you feel your muscles starting to grow. And, you know, every man knows as a man you feel happy about that, whether you want to admit it or not, you do. But there's always someone in there that's bigger and better than you. And in my case, there was lots of them that were bigger and better than me. <laughs> and my point being is that sometimes we feel... Like you're not strong enough to do the things that need to be done in our lives. You might not feel strong enough to be a father. You might not feel strong enough to remain single until the time that God wants you to get married. You may not feel strong enough to fulfill the call of God upon your life, whatever role that might be. But God says, I am your strength. That's what he says. I am your strength. And here's the verse that we claim. God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Now when you read something like this, now this is a little bit different than the scripture that we just looked at that was in the book of Ephesians. This one is in the book of Psalms and it's written like poetry. So it's a man in this particular case writing this scripture like it's poetry. So he's writing from his heart because all of you poets in here know that you write what you feel, right? If you don't feel it, you don't really write very well, and it's important to write what's going on in your life. So it would be possible to say, well, that applies to him. But whenever anything gets into what we call the canon of Scripture, the canon of Scripture is how we get these writings to be the Word of God or how we know that the Word of God 
that they are the Word of God, it now becomes not just poetry. It now transfers from just being a man's feelings into being the Word of God, into being how God feels. So the psalmist is saying, God is my strength and my portion forever. And God allowed it to be in the canon of Scripture because it wasn't just his poetry. It was now applicable to every one of his people. God is not just the psalmist's strength. He's your strength. He's my strength. So whenever we start saying, I'm not strong enough, we lie. That sounds very strong and harsh, doesn't it? We lie. But the truth is, we do, because it's not true. You are more than strong enough. You are more than powerful enough, because God Almighty is your strength. He is the one that works in your life. (laughs) There were so many times, I, I can't go into all the detail, but the preparation to, you know, some of the, uh, when I have some of the pastors from the states come over, they remind me of things that uh, we talked about ages ago, and I remember feeling so, like, not capable of being able to do this work here that I'm doing now. I felt so like, man, this is just, it's going to take, like, a miracle worker to make it happen, you know, and I'm anything but a miracle worker but scriptures like we looked at here gave me confidence and said, it's not about you, Tom. It's not what you can do or who you are or any of that. It is what God can do through you. And if that applies to me, it must apply to you. If not, then I would be separate from you, and I'm not. So the reality is whatever you're going through, whatever you feel like you can't do, I'm here to tell you that you can. Um, And and why am I saying that? Because God is your strength and your portion forever. Not for a season, not just when you need it, but all the time forevermore. Thank God for that. You ought to give the Lord a hand clap for that. Let me give you one more. And again, I'm laying these out here to give you a little of encouragement. But my main purpose is so you can see how it works. That when you're at home and you're reading your word, you know, that, and you don't have to do this all the time, but you should do it on a regular basis. Like, read the scripture, how it conflicts with what you're saying, and then choose to believe God's word over what you say or you feel. And, and that, that is something, it's a discipline you've got to get into, because it's very easy to fall into these things, say, I feel overwhelmed, I'm nothing special, I'm not strong enough. That's a person of low self-esteem, isn't it? And then you begin to say, well, I have low self-esteem. I'm always a person of low self-esteem. Well, you have low self-esteem because you're basing it on you. And you're not basing it on what God says about you or about what... (laughs) I'm saying it really harsh, aren't I? (laughs) About you. I mean what God's saying about you. (laughs) And what his word says about all of us. Okay, let's give you one last one. I don't know what to do, what we say. I don't know what to do. You ever been like that? Let me give you some things in life that you don't know what to do. I don't know what to do because I'm stuck in a relationship that is not seemingly all it should be. I don't know what to do because my parents don't live out the gospel that they claim to believe. I don't know what to do because my children are wayward and don't listen and I feel like a failure. I don't know what to do because I need a career that I can take care of my family and provide the money for, but I don't know what to do. I've gotten into this situation and circumstance, maybe of my own accord, maybe of someone else's accord, but the truth is, is I don't know what to do. You ever been there? Say amen. Because we've all been where we don't know what to do. (laughs) One of my favorite responses to people when they ask me is this. I don't know. Because I'm being honest. I don't know. But I always say this. I can find out. I can find out. And you know why? Because God says this. I will give you wisdom. I will give you wisdom. That's why you can say... I don't know what to do, but God says, I will give you wisdom, and that just negates the part, I don't know what to do. 
And the scripture we claim in that, it says, if any of you lacks wisdom, did that say, did some of you lacks wisdom? Does it say the men of the church lacks wisdom? Do the ladies of the church lack wisdom? Do the elders of the church lack wisdom? Do the ones who've been in church forever lack wisdom? No, it says if any of us, and I lay all those things out for you, not to be foolish, but to get you kind of breaking off, because in our minds, maybe not specifically, but sometimes it just tends to come up. We think, yeah, they're wise, therefore they get wisdom. No, they're wise because they believe the verse. They're wise because they stopped saying, I don't know what to do, and started saying, God's going to give me wisdom. So if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God. You should ask God. And we don't ask God. I I won't say we, I'll say you. I ask God. But I say so many don't ask God. I know because I, don't, I know that the prayer life of the average Christian is very small and very short. You can judge that just by what happens in corporate prayer meetings. Any pastor in any church in any denomination will tell you that many of the people who claim to be strong believers rarely pray. It's the truth. But if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God. And the reason is this, because he gives generously to all without finding fault. He doesn't go, well, yeah, man, but you, you were mean to your mom. <laughs> you, you, you were a bad person. He doesn't say, well, yeah, but you remember last Tuesday, you really screwed up, mate. You know, it's really bad. You know, he, he didn't do that. He says, without finding fault, you ask God, he gives and dispenses wisdom. But the question is, are you listening? One of the things I've learned in conversationalists, and I'm not being a conversationalist, trying to become a conversationalist, is so many people don't stop to listen. You know, they they just want to say what they want to say, and they they keep talking, and that's why you'll hear people, and and once I tell you this, you're going to notice it in your conversation. They just start overriding you, you know, before you're you're saying one thing, and they override you. And, you know, there's a little bit of that that goes on to keep the conversation going. That's not a problem if you have a little bit of overriding, you know. Me and Gracie know each other so well, I can finish her sentences, she can finish mine. So we have a little bit of kind of overriding as we're discussing something, but I'm talking about where people don't even take time to consider what you said. Consider the wisdom that you've received. Or they just look at you like, that's too simple. I was expecting from on high God to come down with fire and flames and a dark cloud and thunder and pound it into my heart and you just said, pray? Oh, that's oftentimes our response to what God speaks to us, and then we lack the wisdom. He says he will give generously to all without finding fault. Then he confirms it again. It will be given to you. So here's how we work in our lives. We went over four common feelings, common emotions that people go through. We discuss what we say and what God says And we gave you four verses to claim right now. Can you imagine if you did this each and every day? If you begin to even do it every week. Let's just say you did it effectually once a month. That would be 12 issues in your life that would be totally transformed because you stop listening to what you say and start listening to what God says And now you base and live your life based on the promise, the claim from God. Man, what a difference. What a difference. And tonight, that's all I have for you. Not because I don't have more. Preachers, especially my age, can talk a long time. But I want this to become you. You wonder how certain people are well and good and awesome at being a Christian, part of it is this, learning how to take what they say, push that aside, and go with what God says, and more than that, take the verse, not just what they heard God say, heard someone say God says, but they've got the scripture that says right there, 
once you know that you know what the scripture means, you can claim it. Are you with me here today? Stand to your feet. We're going to pray. We're gonna... If you've been blessed or challenged by today's preaching and you'd like to get in touch with us, the easiest way is via our website at www.newharvestuk.com. You can email us at info at newharvestuk.com or look us up on Facebook or Twitter. You can call us on 0161 278 6305 or you can even write to us at 194 Chapel Street, Salford, Manchester, M36BY. We'd also like to extend a warm welcome for you to join us at any of our services. However you might be feeling and whatever you might have been told, know this. God loves you and there's a place for you in his kingdom. God bless you. We're praying for you. And once again, thank you for listening.